Okay, good morning, everyone. I hope uh, you can hear me. Thank you, Achira. So let me start uh, another session on business analysis and system design module. Uh, in my today's topic, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, system analysis part, especially the requirements modeling. But before we go for requirement modeling part, initially I will talk about uh, various uh, uh, software development techniques. So let's start. Right. Uh, and this part, we talk about the system development methodologies available uh, in, uh, the, you know, uh, in the industry as well as in academia. We talk about uh, uh, when you want to do anything, uh, we need a framework which used to structure and plan and control of developing information system. So remember last time we discussed about the project management where we have each of these phases and we have to have time that we want to manage and we talk about identify crucial path and so on. So uh, compared to that in information system development, we need some uh, you know guidance or the frameworks to uh, develop uh, information system software. Here are like uh, some examples. The traditionally, we use uh, what we call the system development life cycle or SDLC. This is uh, known as uh, the structured way of doing or traditional way of uh, developing software. Then uh, after, that is uh, one of the oldest and you know still uh, we are using this uh, in uh, you know software development. And after that, uh, there are two other techniques actually developed. We also going to visit or. Uh, briefly discuss uh, those methodologies. Those are like joint application development and rapid application development. And finally, we are going to look at the, the latest software development uh, in uh, which is now uh, most of the industries are heavily re relying on agile, uh, you know, software development methodology. So that's what basically we are going to focus on today. Right, now, if we start with the traditional software development technique, which we call system development life cycle, there are like five uh, phases, starting from system planning, analysis, design, implementation, and support and security. So those are like well-defined, and each of these phases, there are predefined set of outputs. For example, in system planning, uh, the output will be what we call the preliminary investigation report. So this stage, uh, basically you are going to decide whether you are going to have an information system, whether the organization have the financial feasibility to uh, you know, uh, go for a you know, information system and so on. Then comes the system analysis part, which uh, what we are going to focus on in coming sessions, which will uh, generate the output will be something called system requirements documents. Now, in this phase, usually we collect, uh, you know, all the user requirements, we call uh, functional requirements that you want to have in the, in the system, as well as non-function like performance, uh, you know, aspects of information system. Now, once you complete that phase, you go to the next one, which we call the system design phase, where you uh, use different modeling techniques to make the design of the system. This is the outcome of this uh, phase. We call it system design and specification. So for example, uh, let's take a database, uh, for example, starting from the conceptual model uh, we can talk about the logical model and so on. So we will look at the system uh, design aspect of this. Then uh, 
uh, once we have the design in place, we go for system implementation. Uh, that means we select what uh, software we are, okay, what uh, frameworks we are going to use, what uh, programming languages we are going to use. Once you make that decision, you will start the implementation process, which means you will get a functioning system. Well, now once you do that, final step would be like you are going to deploy that. Uh, and then you have to, you know, maintain the information system. That stage we call system security and support. So outcome of this is called fully operational system. So those are like briefly uh, the five phases that, you know, are in the software development lifecycle framework. So if you have, uh, you know, very traditional, uh, you know, software that you want to develop and you have clear cut goals and if your requirements are not changing uh, during the, the development, maybe still this might be uh, one of the preferred framework for your software development project. Right. System planning. Um, uh, what happens during the system planning stage will be uh, it start with the system request. Somebody has to, you know, say that okay, we need the information system. Like for example, in our university, um, you know, it could come from the management level or it could come from the user level. That okay, there's a request for a system to be in place, and then uh, this preliminary investigation it performs the evaluate this request whether it's possible. Uh, in financially, for example, whether we have a capacity to, you know, develop such a system, do we have an operational feasibility, like once you develop, do we have, like, uh, you know, people to work with the system and so on, so that will happen in the system planning stage. And as I told you earlier, so outcome will be come as a report to the management, usually we call preliminary investigation, where that, okay, so this is the proposal, uh, for the management to make the decision whether they are going to invest in uh, system development. In system analysis phase, uh, as I told you earlier, it will be the development of the logical model of the system. So first part will be the requirement modeling, which means you have to gather all the requirements of various different users using various different techniques. For example, uh, you can interview like top management or the middle management if when you have like few users, but then if you have large number of users, you can go for service or the questionnaires. Then, for example, you can, uh, you know, uh, collect the documents required for to process or the generate within the system. Uh, and also uh, you can use observation as a technique to fact find it just to understand what is happening in the organization and also you can have a sample. So this fact finding we use to build the model, uh, which we are going to discuss later today, uh, starting from business model to data and process model, object model. That means basically uh, we can use it for the designing of the system. Uh, the deliverable will be, as I told you earlier, that you are, have a requirements document. So remember now, by this time, you have actually got the green line from the top management that you have decided to, you know, have a information system. So that's why you, uh, you know, collect the required uh, information to get the system. Okay, then comes the design part. Now you have all the requirements in place. Let's, uh, you know, now you have to create the, what we call the physical model of the system. Right. So, for example, you can develop user interfaces, for example, like how, uh, you know, what information you are going to have in the beginning, uh, what type of users are in the system, okay, what are the, you know, uh, different interfaces you are going to uh, provide for different users and so on. So, the, all these things will be developed in this stage. And there are tools that actually can be helpful for you to do this. So all the necessary inputs, outputs, as well as the processes are identified. And during this phase, you also determine the architecture of the system. For example, whether it's a 
web-based system, like, uh, you know, you have a 3D architecture, 2D architecture, and so on. And then, uh, and you can use programmers, will use the logical into what we call the program modules and the code. So the outcome would be the system design. Once you have the system design, then next place is implementation. So you have to write the program in the uh, chosen programming language. You have to test it. You have to create various uh, different documentation. And then, you know, once you complete, you have to actually deploy the system. So there are two parts of this. Uh, sometimes organization might prefer to, you know, develop the system by themselves, which, uh, for example, if they have their separate IT, uh, IT unit, which they have the developers, then that might be a one choice, or maybe you can have a consultant, or you can outsource this, or maybe you can get it from outside. So if, the, if you actually get the system from the outside, then usually uh, you do some modifications, simply you have to configure, you know, uh, and you have to modify to suit the purchase software to your system. So outcome of this phase will be like, you are going to implement a complete functioning information system, right? So that means once we finish this stage, the system is ready to use. Right, now comes the crucial part. Now, often you know that when you install a new system, right, if it is new, there could be, you know, some errors uh, or bugs in, in the software, which causes, uh, you know, um, ID staff to again, you know, maintain the system or fixing those things. And sometimes, for example, uh, some of the information might uh, change, like you know, new tax rates, which you have to incorporate in your in your system. Right. So, idea is once you enhance, it will improve or it will provide both new features. At the same time, it will actually benefit the organization. So, the idea is you need to maximize what we call the ROI, return on investment, which we will discuss in uh, another session, and. You know, you have to have security controls to safeguard the system, especially in both external and internal threats. And one thing you need to remember is if you have well-designed system, it should secure, reliable, maintainable, and stable. So when you see a secure, remember, like especially if it's a web-based systems, uh, people can hack into the system through the uh, the internet connectivity and you know make a mess with that. So you have to have security, you know, measurements to prevent things like that. And reliability means like there's no downtime. For example, there could be failures, but you know you have to make sure that you know you know people would say usually ninety nine percent of the uptime, which means you make sure that there's no breakdown in the system. Then maintainable uh, usually the software is maintained by various different teams for a longer period of time. So what might happen, those who actually develop the software for this first time might not be available during the maintenance. So remember, you have to design a system such a way that the, the software could be maintainable. Scalable in other hands, like meaning what might happen, like if you have a grow, growing number of customers, so if people are interested in your product, you know, you will get increased number of customers, whether you are, your system can handle this. This is what we call the scalability. So you, you should be able to scale your software so that you can command the increased demand, for example. Right, now that we have discussed about the structure development uh, system, uh, system development life cycle, so the let's look at the another you know framework which we call joint application development. Now, um, the 
most of the time, these kind of frameworks focus on the teams. And there are many others similar to this. For example, even the reason the Agile comes under as a team-based approach. So uh, what happens during the joint application and development, uh, it will find the facts and the requirements to bring the users for the development process. So previously users, uh, for example, our traditional software development life cycle, the user involvement is very minimal or it will happen in the, the early stages. But then this approach, you will use users actively in the development process. And that is what in most of the recent development frameworks which uses that users will be an active part or partners in the development. So according to the JAD, uh, usually they should meet over a period of days or weeks in a special place or at some offsite location. So during the meeting, they look at uh, what is in the existing system you will get uh, user inputs and the expectations and then document user requirements for the new system. And you normally iterate this one. So if you look at the advantages of this is it allows the users to participate effectively in the requirements and modeling. So the users are, I told you, users will be the part of the development team. Because of that, if you compare this with the, the traditional structured approach, it will be more accurate, right? And also uh, the team may better understand uh, the, about the goals and then uh, they can also make a strong commitment to the success of the new system. But always you have disadvantages as well. Remember this is more expensive and sometimes if your group is large, it's very difficult to manage. So those are some of the disadvantages of uh, joint application development. Right. Then comes the rapid application development. Again, uh, this is also a team-based technique. And the idea is compared to a traditional system development life cycle, you need to speed up the development process to have a functioning information system. Uh, and then it is also known as a complete methodology. Like you have a four phases in the life cycle, which is parallel to the traditional software development phases. So if you look at this RAD, um, rapid application development, so what you see is the, the four phases, which is you can map into traditional software open life cycle as well. So the first part will be the requirements planning task. So you uh, first agree on the project scope and the requirements, and then you get the approval. Once you get the approval, you will have two parts in parallel. Uh, you have a user design part, you build the model, and then you have uh, implementation we call, uh, you know, construction. So all these application development, coding, and testing happens during this stage. And then finally, you will have data conversion, testing, and also the deployment, and also things like user training will happen during the, the fourth stage. Right. So why people use RAD? Because uh, people want to reduce the cost and the time, and then they want to increase the uh, the probability of the success as well. So uh, they are for RAD also heavily uh, rely on the prototyping. Uh, that means creating a working model uh, and also active use of or use involvement. Right? So compared to traditional software development life cycle, you will get um, a working model compared to traditional uh, system development life cycle because it, it might take years, right? And usually you will get at the end of the last phase, which is too late if there are like serious changes that you want to make. Therefore, you have like 
you know, many possible working models. And then you actually can talk to the users and see whether, you know, your prototype is meeting their requirements and so on. Right. And then once you get the user input, you can also make changes to the, the process. And this can, you know, continue until the whole system is developed. And also the users are satisfied. Okay, advantages. Uh, idea of this framework is we can develop the, the, the software quickly and you can save well, uh, the cost as well. The disadvantages is, um, you know, uh, one problem is you are not going to emphasize what we call the company strategy in business needs. So what might happen is system might work well for short time, but the long term that it might not, you know, um, work well. So that is one one of the disadvantage. And then uh, when you have like what we call the rapid application development, as name suggests that you do this in short cycles and quickly, and then what might happen? You don't have enough time uh, to develop the quality product or consistency or, or we follow the design standards or creating documents. So you don't have enough uh, you know, time to do that because you focus on the development on the prototype, not, not particularly looking at, um, uh, looking at, for example, things like the documentation. So next one. The, and the last one is what we call the agile technology. So agile software development frameworks. So in agile, what happens, you are not going to develop the system completely at once. Instead, you focus on uh, selecting a couple of features and then you improve them, right? So idea is you build series of working models, which we call the prototypes, and then with the user, you make changes uh, to suit user requirements. So the ideas, I main core ideas in Agile is it will a continuous process and it will revise with the developers, extend, merge early versions to come to a final product. So main thing it emphasizes is the continuous feedback, especially from the users, and then each increment step uh, will be, uh, you know, um, affected by what you have learned in the prior system. Since it's an iterative one, if you make some mistakes in the beginning, that you can actually make change. Okay, one example agile method is called the Scrum. So let me brief on Scrum methodology, but I highly recommend you uh, will read articles uh, to understand how exactly Scrum works. Some terminology are used in Scrum. For example, the product backlogs are kind of a features that you are intend to implement. Now, let's say that uh, you have a library information system that you are going to build, and the product backlog could be like you know creating a user interface uh, for logging into the system. Right. So, likewise, you can have a list of features to be implemented, and then you can. Uh, select one or two into one we call the cycle, which we call sprint. So what happens, you have all your features as a you know set of uh, product backlog, like, like in here. And then, you know, this is we call team. Team will uh, work on a time frame. This time frame is known as a sprint. Usually this can go from two weeks to four weeks. So that depends on your time requirement. But during the planning, uh, together with the user, uh, the team will decide what, uh, are, what are the features that you are going to uh, you know, implement. So this is what we call the uh, sprint backlog. So from the product backlog, we will decide in the meeting like what features to be implemented in this two to four week cycle. And during four weeks cycle, the team frequently meets, uh, hopefully every day, um, 
maybe morning and evening, like uh, to understand whether there are any issues with the, the team, the ideas you are going to resolve in, in that place. So that's uh, what the plan is. And then you work on implementing the features. And once you finish it, that you can actually, uh, you know, implement. Right. So this is what we call uh, physical interactions. And then uh, in those some scrum sessions, uh, you have various different roles. Uh, you know, sometimes people use pigs and chickens to represent these different, uh, you know, roles in uh, the agile development. So the term pig is used usually to indicate that it will be the product owner, somebody who is responsible for a particular product. And then uh, the development team, uh, you have uh, chickens, which we call the users, and then other stakeholders and managers. So there are some specific guidelines they emphasizing on the time blocks I told you about, like it could be two to four weeks time, and it really depends on, uh, you know, uh, different teams, right? And what you have is mostly the team-based activities. Right, so, I hope now you got an idea about the uh, Agile as well. So let's look at the advantages and disadvantages of Agile. If you look at the Agile advantages, they are very flexible, efficient, uh, dealing especially with change of requirements. So if your software requires frequent changes, then you might uh, choose Agile method that you develop that. Right, team interactions and then the community-based values are very important uh, in a situation like this. And also there will be a frequent deliverables and then it validate the project and it will reduce the risk as well. The disadvantage you might have to face is the team members need to have a higher level of technical and interpersonal skills. This is a must. On the other hand, since you have, you don't focus on the documentation aspect of this, especially uh, these kind of methodologies, that might be a problem. Or later on, for example, um, in traditional software development, you have to document everything. That's why one of the reasons it takes some time. But here, the lack of structure also poses some problems. So keep, keep, keep on it. Right. So, Overall project success will be subjected to a change of the scope as well as user requirements to uh, evolve during the, the project. Right. Okay, with that said, I hope uh, we have the, the next step I would like to discuss about the, uh, the next phase. Um, and then, uh, so once you get the uh, the requirements, we have to analyze. So this phase is called system analysis phase. So you need to understand the the project, and we have to make sure that it will also support the the business requirement. And then uh, you have to build the solid foundation for the development. So having said that, um, what we see is, how do you develop this? So the activities. So there are four activities you can identify in the system analysis space. The first one is requirements modeling. So which means you need to describe the current system and you need to describe or identify requirements of the new system. For example, uh, let's say we are going to create a new information system for the university. You have to first describe the current system. For example, we use 
various different systems currently uh, to manage the attendance, manage your results, manage your financial information. But then uh, right now we have used various, various systems, but we don't have any uh, single system which manage everything. So let's assume that, okay, that is a requirement. So you one of the requirements you can say, okay, you have need a one single system manage everything, something like that. Then you will have data and process modeling. Um, during the data and process modeling, you will have the system data and processes graphically. So uh, we will talk about modeling like data flow diagrams here to understand what data and what will be the process. For example, now when you want to uh, register for the courses, you know that you have to first register as a student in the register office, and then you have to make necessary payment for the finance, and then only you are included in the LMS, and then you are allowed to, you know, uh, you know, join in the teaching and the learning process. So you can see that there are various data and information will be exchanged in these places. For example, you have to provide all your demographic information to the registrars. You know, that means you provide the data. And then, for example, uh, when you present your A-level results, uh, the registrar office might check whether you have meet the minimum requirements. If if you provide the minimum, if you have the minimum entry requirements, for example, then only uh, they register you and then you will get, uh, you know, registration number, for example. So you see there are some data exchange happening in, you know, various places. So that part we will discuss under data and process modeling. Then we have object modeling, especially if you're using object-oriented programming language to implement your uh, you know, system, natural way you see is as objects. Uh, for example, when you use object orientation, for example, you can incorporate both uh, you know, your data as well as method in a single unit. Whereas uh, without, if you're using without object orientation, it will be a bunch of you know, functions you are using. Then the last one is your development strategy. So we discussed about the various different development strategies earlier. So which you have to decide which one is you are going to use for the development. So the deliverable of this is what we call the system requirements document. And this is our graphical representation. As you can see, the first three methods, the requirements modeling and the data process modeling and object modeling, these are iterative ones. And once you finish your modeling task, only you move on to the development strategies, right? So now that we have got an idea, let's uh, focus on different tools, techniques available to design a system. So during our first module about in programming concepts, we basically look at uh, how to develop very small, you know, uh, single, programs in Python. But then if you are going to create very large uh, software system that you need some tools to help you uh, in creating such a system. So those are the things that we are going to discuss in this section. Right, so models will basically help various users in the system. So that can use in the users, managers, IT professionals uh, to understand the system. Uh, remember again, this is a design phase. We are not implemented. It. It's like, okay, I want to build my own house. Then I need to have a plan, right? So what I do usually, I will meet an architect and tell that, okay, my requirements, okay, I need my bedroom like this. Okay, I need this, need this. Okay, it should be two story, three story, you know, depend on requirements where you actually talk about your requirements. Um, so what happens uh, without, uh, you know, uh, you know, building a house like a basunahin, for example, 
you know, architect will come up with a plan and maybe sometimes a 3D model so that you can identify your requirements more on, uh, you know, you know, you, you can correct any mistakes is very beginning so that you don't have any issues when you're building. So similar to that in uh, software system is also very complex, although you don't see it as a very complex system development. It's very serious and we need some tools to graphically represent our requirements. So the modeling part that we will discuss here, we will have various graphical models, right? So the why we use graphical model is anybody should be able to understand this, right? Uh, and this also could represent various stages in the development. So during the requirement modeling, we use different tools, uh, which we use to describe the business processes. What do you mean by business processor here is like any tasks, you have a several you know, tasks to be done. For example, I talk about the registering student in the university environment, which you are very familiar. There are six, uh, you know, several steps going on. And then you have requirements, and then there are some user interactions with the system. So simply this system analysis is, uh, is use modeling and as well as a fact finding uh, in an interactive fashion. So various different diagrams we are going to discuss under this uh, business process model, which describes uh, the whole business process from A to Z. Data flow diagram, which focuses on the how the data is actually exchanged among different entities. Then UML diagram, especially if you are planning to implement using object-oriented fashion, okay, this is what we need to understand. Right, let me explain one example first. I, I want you to focus on one modeling technique today, and then I will put you into the breakout rooms. Let me check, yes, whether I can put into the breakout rooms. Yes, I will put you in a breakout rooms as a group work. Uh, so this is the, uh, the second group work that you are going to do, where you are going to build the functional decomposition diagram. So let me explain what it is. The functional decomposition diagram, as the name says, you go from, uh, from top to bottom fashion, where you represent each of the functions for the processors. Uh, so using that analysis can show what are the business functions. And then you can also identify the, the low level function and the processes. So this could be used in various uh, stages of the development. So uh, you can use it in the requirements modeling. Uh, and then you can use the model business functions and show how they are organizing the lower level processes. So these processes can be translated into what we call the modules or the functions uh, in, in the development. So let me show you with an example. So for example, let's assume that we want to model a library uh, using functional decomposition diagram. So this is how it looks like. As you can see, we have a top part here, right? So you can see the library management, but then under the library management, there are various other things. For example, you have human resources, we focus on uh, the staff. Then you have finance and accounting, which focus on the finances information. Then actually the real work comes here, the library operations, so it comes under this. Then fundraising will be another one, and new use acquisition will be another. So these are various functions comes on the library management. But I know the, the core uh, operation will be the library operations. Um, so under that, we can identify operations and also the budgeting. And then book management and also the personal assignment. And we know that we have interest in book management. For example, we have functions for add and remove books, check out and return books archive, checkout list, and the user list. 
news updates, report generation. So you can see in top-down fashion, it lists out all the, 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 the requirements. So these are these phases could be in modules when you actually develop your system. Right. Let me give you another example. So this is another example where uh, we talk about uh, e-commerce website and how it is, what facilities and the core functionalities in the system. So as you can see, it says e-commerce and then you have customer services and administrative services. And under the customer services, you can see that the customers can browse for products, they can search, they can read reviews, they can write reviews, so all that information comes here. Then customers also have a shopping cart where they can actually create a shopping cart and you can add items. Then there's another module we are focused on the customer authentication. We can have user profiles, purchase histories, purchase. So all this information we can keep in one branch. And then another branch uh, is allocated uh, for new user registrations. So create user profile. Then under the administration services, you can see add, edit inventory, especially in the uh, e-commerce, you can add or edit the products. You can, uh, in this particular case, books. So you can add new books or you can update inventories. So you can see with, with this uh, function decomposition diagram, you can identify all the module requirements in a system. Right. Okay. So let's have a, a small, So as we have already seen, uh, this could be used to understand what modules that you would like to have in your uh, software system. So that is the idea of identifying it using uh, the modeling technique functional decomposition diagram. Now, similar to that, there's another uh, modeling technique we are going to look at now. So in this particular one, uh, this is called business process modeling. Uh, idea of the business process modeling is we can identify, you know, uh, what will happen in the whole business process, how something happens. For example, uh, things like how to handle airline reservation. Let's say you want to take a, um, a trip to some other country so you can make a reservation so uh, so this happens in multiple levels and we can actually visualize using uh, business process modeling how it exactly happened right so uh, let me show you like one example uh, this is uh, you can see in a rectangle shape block what you see is order processing system and then uh, you can see that this is divided into two parts, which we call swim, swim lanes, which represent different uh, users and how they are interaction with the system. So in this particular case, if it is a new user, uh, you can see the first task would be like getting his uh, credit data, uh, which means uh, whether they have enough credit to make purchases and then validating the credit system and you know assigning a customer number. Now, once it happens, you know the new customer becomes an existing customer. And then there you can see you have a process order and then prepare billing and then create shipping data. So that actually visualize how particular a system function right, in business process modeling. Now, this can have like more complex element as well. The second example you ought to notice is uh, taking a leave from a company. Now, for example, let's say I want to take a leave. Usually, I cannot just, you know, leave without informing. So, usually, I have to, uh, you know, contact my manager, whoever managing myself, and then I have to request for a leave. And he, if that my manager approves it only, then I'm allowed to make a leave. So in this one, this business process modeling, uh, what you notice is exactly the same thing. 
So you can see here, this is about the ABC company, which explains, elaborate how the leave application handled. And there are three sim lanes, which is indicated for the employee, the second sim lane for the manager, the third one is for the HR, usually the human resource uh, department is there, even for in our university, we have a HR department who actually take care of, uh, you know, all these information. So you can see that uh, uh, this uh, circle indicates the start of the process. And the first task is when you want to take a leave, you have to fill a leave application form. So you fill the leave application form and then you have to submit for approval. So you have to get the approval from the manager so that it comes to his swim lane. And the manager will evaluate the leave application. And you see that there are two decisions. Manager has to say yes or no, which means approve or not approve. If it is not approved, that means we inform the employee that the request is declining and that's the end of the process. So this circle in red color indicates that this is the end of it. So you make a request and your manager says no, then that's the end of it, okay? Now let's say that the manager is approved your uh, application, then it'll be a yes. So if it is yes, then you have to inform the uh, employee the request is accepted and that will actually handle the HR because HR is the one who is actually recording all our attendance information, the leaves and also when preparing their salaries and so on. So that will come here and HR will be managed application and then employee side, you take the leave, which indicates the end of that business. So you can see, uh, so this can clearly show you uh, using various graphical elements, how something happens with uh, the involve on involvement of various different parties. Right. Now, having said that, another more complex one. So you can see here that again, uh, pizza ordering process, uh, where you have a pizza shop and the customer separated here. So this side, you see the pizza shop and here we see the customer and this will be initiated with, okay, you're hungry and then you have to, you know, order a pizza. So now when you want to uh, order a pizza, so you maybe visit uh, their website and you select the pizza and then you place the order. Once you place the order, that will initiate the, the process within the pizza shop where you have to, you know, bake, the pizza and then you can also uh you know have a process here which indicates that okay uh with the customer as well right so you make the pizza you have to deliver the pizza so you make the pizza and then you just wait and then you can make a request okay you know you just wait for let's say some time and then you ask like where's my pizza and then they will actually check and let us let let the you know uh, you know customer knows where the where the the pizza is the process is for example it's in uh, you know it's just baking or maybe you can say that it's on 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 the way right so once you deliver the pizza you can see here there's another direction where the pizza is received uh, and then the customer has to pay for the Pizza, that payment is received from the pizza shop. Again, again, delivery guy is the one who's received that one. And then, you know, with that, uh, you can make a receipt and that will be the end of this. And this process goes on. You pay the pizza and then you eat the pizza, you know, then you are satisfied. That will be end of that business, uh, you know, process. So you can see that it's very important sometimes to understanding what happens in each of these processes because you can't lose any information. So that is one way why we graphically, you know, represent. So it's very important when you're capturing uh, the all the requirements you need. Right. 
that's about the uh, business process models. Let me now explain the third diagrams, which is focusing on how to how data is actually flow uh, from various processes. So this is called data flow diagrams. Uh, data flow diagrams usually show how the system stores different processes, how the transformation of the data, and, and we will discuss this later on as a separately. Right. Now, when it comes to uh, system requirements, uh, during requirement, I told you, you have to uh, identify and describe all the system requirements. So that means, for example, what features that you need to have in your information system, right? For example, in library information system, we, we need a way to uh, record books. When you loan a book, that information also should be recorded. When you uh, bring back the book, that means you return the book, you have to uh, record it in the information system and so on. Right. So user requirement, usually you have uh, five categories. Uh, you can identify them as outputs, inputs, the processes, performance, and controls. Right. Now, having said that, let's look at some example. Uh, for example, it's a record system. The output is you have to have a transcript. So in the transcript, usually you will have a postcode post name, number of credits, the grade, and also the date of the examination. Now, the input to this should be the grades. Uh, so you have to put them as the input. The process will be the student record system should calculate the GPA for each semester. Now, there are performance as well. For example, uh, we have to say that how many users can be accommodated in your system. For example, we can say, system must support 25 users online simultaneously. So this is very, very important because that is the performance requirement you need to have, right? And then finally the control. For example, we have to say that usually examination records should be in the secure system. So therefore we have to provide some logging security in the operating system level. So as well as in the application level. So those are the, the, the things that we need to uh, you know, focus on. Right. Now, during uh, this, you need to find facts. We discuss various techniques you can use. You can use interviewing. You can use uh, document reviews. You can observe. You can use questionnaires. You can use sampling and research. These are some ways of collecting information. Now, uh, I told you in brief why there are like several ways of facts finding. For example, I told you when you have too many users to handle, then you cannot interview each and everyone. You should go for a you know technique like questionnaires. But then if you want to you know meet the higher level administrators, then you should interview them to get more information, uh, their information requirement for the information system so but getting an interview when not just asking questions so you need to have careful planning because you can't interview multiple times so therefore you have to plan what exactly you need and also uh, when you want to deal with various different people therefore you have to have a strong interpersonal and communication skills that's also another uh, aspect we need to uh, focus on uh, so, for example, when you want to interview uh, as a system analysis, you need to decide whom to be interviewed and you have to set the interview objectives, you have to prepare this, and then you have to conduct the interview, right? So, you can use various different software tools for this purpose, for example, questionnaire. Uh, now you can automatically generate, for example, and uh, that will be uh, easier, the burden one 
one only thing that you is you have to carefully go through uh, what is uh, generated with it's useful for to a requirement or not okay to conclude this um at this uh, stage of requirements modeling as a system developers should have a clear understanding of the business processes and the system requirements and once you have it you can actually go for the uh, logical model of the system which we will discuss in the next session right uh, i think you have already done the book work i will put in the link in the moodle uh, sorry if we, uh, you know lms so you can upload your submissions and during the interactive session we will have a small discussion of your group work so that's what the plan for our next week interactive session thank you guys let's meet uh next hopefully next tuesday day. thank you